Hello everybody, Scott Golden here with the Superstars of Wrestling Review Series, June 16th, 1990 is our episode for this moment, uh, and um, again, episodically, a really enjoyable show because there's angle movement, but also each, each uh, moment kind of matters from the standpoint of even the squash matches have a purpose. Rick Rude does his um, normal Rude Awakening type of thing. Uh, Rude, of course, headed towards the main event of SummerSlam with the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, faces Red Tyler here. Rude goes at Tyler pretty aggressively early and a drop kick under the chin uh, by, by Tyler. Kind of brushed off by Rude. Rude is probably in the best shape of his career. He's lean down. He's super uh, muscular but lean. Uh, Rude manages some jabs, almost like he's trying to get more of a boxer feel. Does some push-ups mid-match, which is a, a thing that I've always loved. Chris Candido used to, used to do that in ECW uh, when he had advantages, and a couple of shows I was on with him on the independent level, I actually saw him do that too. Uh, Rude hits the Rude Awakening, one, two, three, uh, one finger pin. Uh, Rude probably looks the best he ever had in his career. Would have been interesting to see Rick Rude win the uh, world championship. I know they weren't going to go that way, but it was would have been cool anyway. Uh, we see the hype of uh, the Hogan return. Um, you know, Tugboat at this point basically begging for fans to do more as far as writing letters to Hogan. Um, you know, they give a... Give a uh, um, P.O. Box, P.O. Box 911 in Venice Beach, California. I just find that kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, I assume they forwarded it off to Stanford from the P.O. Box or whatever the heck. But um, anyway, that's interesting. Earthquake and Jimmy Hart basically say that writing the letters means absolutely nothing to the future of Hulk Hogan. Um, and the Rockers, Marty Jannetty and Shawn Michaels up next. Uh, they are... You actually see a couple of Rockers t-shirts, which is, I look back and I'm sad that I never got a Rockers t-shirt. Uh, anyhow, um, Janetti and Tom Stoner in there, uh, they're going at it with the Orient Express, are the Rockers at this point, still coming off of WrestleMania 6. Haven't really moved into the Power and Glory thing yet, but that, that'll come probably right before SummerSlam. Um, unfortunately, Shawn Michaels has knee surgery here around the summer. And so that's a big deal, atomic drop, and then a uh, sunset flip by Michaels. Michaels and Janetti by this point, probably, I'd say, the second or third team from the top on the babyface side in 1990. Um, many people say they should have gotten a longer tag team championship run. Of course, they did have the tease from Saturday night's main event, but it never really went anywhere because of the broken ring, and there's uh, debate about that. Uh, anyway, Michaels kind of grinds down Michaels uh, and Janetti wearing the purple tights. The rocker dropper, which actually is a move that uh, uh, Chuck Austin took and got a multi-million dollar settlement because his neck was broken off it. If you've never seen the move, um, then you can certainly check that out. Top rope fist drop by Michaels. One, two, three, gets a victory. And then we move into... Uh, Bad News Brown, really short uh, match there. Um, you know, punch, kick, and real basic stuff. Uh, ghetto Blaster for Brown. Uh, Brown never really did terribly much in the ring. Jake Roberts does an inset promo where he talks about, obviously, the fact that um, Bad News Brown scared of snakes. Brown claims he's not, but his proof is different. Sapphire plugs the um, the Superstars ice cream bars. That's a pretty big deal. First time I think we've seen the Warlord, uh, at least during our reviews. Uh, now with Manager Slick. I'm not quite sure why they did that switch, but uh, Warlord balding and more aggressive. Um, Black tights, black boots, and uh, lots more power moves here. Shoulder tackle. This is, I think, his first foray into singles action. I don't know if ever would be correct, but certainly in the World Wrestling Federation. Hanging vertical suplex. Of course, by 91, 
Uh, end of 90, early 91, he's with the British Bulldog. They don't really find him a feud very quickly. I think that's more kind of a feeling of um, not knowing what they were going to do with the split off. I think they had a little bit more plans for the Barbarian, maybe, uh, than they did for the Warlord here. Um, I got to I got to go to one indie show Warlord was on years ago, and he was a massive dude. Uh, short clothesline by the Warlord here, and he hits a uh, running power slam. Actually, this is before the Bulldogs, so running power slam was relatively a rare finish at the time. Um, then we go to Nikolai Volkov making his way into the ring for an enhancement match. He takes the, his uh, Russian cap off, sings the American National Anthem, says thank you to America, goes after Frankie DeFalco. This makes uh, Boris Zukov, his former tag team partner, very upset. Uh, punch kick. By this point, Volkov, who is a massive star in the 70s, but not so much here. Uh, clothesline to the back of the head, one, two, three, gets a victory. But, I, I mean, it's it's awkward. The the, the match quality is, is very subpar, not good. Uh, Macho King and Queen Sherry out to um, basically say they are not done with Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes is just a common man. Um, Elizabeth and Sapphire are both just common women. The promise is made by Sherry. She's not done with Sapphire. And Savage is not done with uh, Dusty Rhodes. They are going to royally handle them. Um, and so the the feet of the Macho King and Queen are going to be kissed by Sapphire, supposedly, uh, and, and Dusty Rhodes. What's amazing to me is they end up kind of teasing that D Brother Love is going to go around and, and do some house show work with them, which ends up him being a referee. Then we see a plug for the Spotlight magazine, a quarterly magazine personality profile type thing um, for the Million Dollar Man, uh, which was a big deal at the time, mainly because it was quarterly. Um, big Boss Man up next faces Jeff Johnson. I don't know that I ever have seen Johnson before. He does exactly what he's supposed to do here. Uh, bumps around for the boss man, single punches, uh, cross body into the backbreaker by the boss man. Boss man, just a few months into his babyface run that lasts a couple of years, even transfers promotions because he goes into WCW in 94 as a babyface too short term. Um, anyway... So, I mean, there's there's a good, you know, almost four-year run where Boss Man is a baby face and um, uh, between two promotions, Sidewalk Slam, Boss Man Slam, one, two, three, gets pinned. He still does the tie him up and, and hook him up with the handcuffs, which strikes me as odd for a baby face to do. Then we see Rick Martel plugging Arrogance, the, the perfume. Uh, we move to Haku versus... Um, Hillbilly Jim, basically, uh, Heenan does making fun of Hillbilly as well, a bit of a redneck. Jim Duggan plugs his upcoming match in the Boston area with Earthquake, basically says he's going to take Earthquake down and he's not scared of a natural disaster. Uh, we do kind of go to that, that is a July 14th, um, edition of a house show in the Boston Garden. By this point, unfortunately, they have eliminated the uh, Boston Garden shows from the New England Sports Network, Hillbilly Jim and Haku, Hercules and Akeem, Nikolai Volkov, Boris Zukov are your plugged matches, and the Bushwhackers and Rhythm and Blues, too, are your plugged matches for this particular show. Hacksaw, Duggan, and Earthquake. Um, just going to give you context and the main event for the Intercontinental Championship, Beefcake and Mr. Perfect. Just amazing to me that those two guys can main event a show in 1990. And we're going to move towards uh, the end of June with our next episode. Until next time, keep your feet on the ground, your mind in the moment. Until next time, everybody.